One easy way to get involved in the hobby of high voltage electronics is to pick up one of these high voltage generators from Amazon or eBay. They can be purchased for less than $10 as I picked this one up for about $8 from Amazon about a year and a half ago. Along with this low price, you also get a pretty outrageous claim. This model saying that it generates 400,000 volts for only $10. With the dielectric strength of air being three kilovolts per millimeter, dielectric strength meaning the electric field intensity that a medium becomes conductive, that means that this module would be able to produce over 13 centimeter arcs. Bogus claims or not, these boost modules are still a lot of fun and very simple to use. They only require about three to six volts on the input side, but on the output side, they'll produce a pretty impressive 40,000 volts DC. Before I continue with the demonstration, I feel the need to offer a word of caution because these things, as the name implies, generate a high amount of voltage and should be treated with a degree of respect. With that out of the way, let's see some cool arcs now. For starters, for the 3 volt DC source, I use two AA batteries. Continuing use of this module, I decided to hook up my switchboat power supply or DC to DC buck converter. One thing is for certain, these things can produce some pretty vicious arcs. I don't even know what their purpose is for. I mean, I'm assuming it's just from a stun gun or something, but either way, it's a lot of fun. These boost modules are fairly small considering the arcs that they're capable of generating, with a length of about two and a half inches, a width of about an inch, and then a height of about 850 thousandths of an inch. One thing I have to warn about using these modules is that if you want to keep using the module, you shouldn't exceed the arc distance, or at least regularly. And in my experience, even though it doesn't say in the product description, it's about one and a half, two centimeters, more than a few seconds, because it can, it can easily be damaged. That's what actually happened with this boost module, is I was using it for another project and had the lead separator too far. After a few long distance arcs, it just stopped working. So in order to learn some about it, we have to first break past this potted epoxy. They put this here typically for you know, protecting their secrets of their electronics, but in this case, I'm sure it's also for safety. So before going into disassembly of the no longer working boost module, I hooked it up to my switch mode power supply set to three volts so that I could gather some temperature data on it when I was running a no load. After switching it on, you can see it draws approximately two and a quarter amps, and you can see a heat source start to originate from a third of the body from the input side. Closer examination shows that this is probably the transformer, and that's why it's heating up. I show with my temperature gun after running for about 40 seconds that it gets to a temperature of about 150 degrees Fahrenheit or 60 degrees Celsius. For this next part, you may want to turn up your volume because I try to show the high pitch sound noise that originates from what I suspect to be the transformer. I even take the windshield off so you can maybe hear this. Another piece of information I was interested in finding out before disassembly was the input and output terminal resistance. For the input, I recorded a value of 320 ohms. And the output resistance proved difficult to record a reliable value. As it tended to jump around a bunch, I found that 1.3 mega ohms came up a lot, yet so did 500 kilo ohms whenever you held it just right, and it seemed to fluctuate. I think some error could be in the way that I held the terminals. However, I know that these boost modules have a tendency to have a high load resistance, so I went with a larger value. Now we go into hardware mode. With a hacksaw, I just create a cut through the top polymer housing. That way I can pry it open with a screwdriver and some pliers. Once the cut was made, I took it out of the vise and pulled at it 
you could tell there was some give, so I took the pliers to it. And then after working with it for a while, just took the screwdriver to it and it came apart pretty easily. I pried at the housing until all that was holding on was the glue for the output terminal wires. After cutting those, then the housing was free. That just left us with the epoxy potting material, which while difficult to get off, I did have a plan for. So after about 20 minutes of heating, chiseling, and prying, and repeating in that order, you can start to identify some of the components that were inside. For instance, right here, we have the primary side of the transformer. We can see the PCB. Some of the high voltage capacitors start to surface. Looks like there's three of them. And then the IC mounted on top. And then of course the input wires. From here, I continue the process of removing the epoxy potting material for easier access to the components. This task, while a tedious one, would eventually prove to pay off, as I could better see the components, the circuit traces, and eventually even extract things and study it in more detail. I then began to cut away the material separating the transformer and the high voltage capacitor side. In order to limit damage to the exposed electronics, I switched from the heat gun and instead grabbed a cheap soldering iron. The use of the soldering iron then made it much easier to chip away at the harder to reach potting material. I even found it useful for separating the upper PCB mounted on top of the transformer. Then with a significant amount of epoxy gone, I decided it was time to start desoldering. Unfortunately, as I was picking off some of the epoxy, I ended up breaking off the small surface mount capacitor next to the transistor. I'd be interested in finding out some of its properties later on. So I grabbed my desoldering wick and then proceeded to desolder the output terminals for the secondary of the transformer. I even began to desolder the other sections but decided to hold off on that. With a bit more cutting and desoldering, I was able to finally separate the two sections. So for section one, I have it labeled into two subsections, the upper PCB and the transformer. Now the original intention with some of this teardown was to keep a lot of the components, especially the transformer. However, unfortunately during disassembly, I ended up fraying some of the secondary windings. And then for section two, we can see the likes of a voltage multiplier start to make itself evident. So we have the high voltage capacitors we've seen before, and then this large output resistor, which is just essentially a resistive trace on a piece of ceramic and then the high voltage diodes too. So since section one was mostly free from the epoxy now, I hooked it up to my buck converter so that I could observe some of its temperature characteristics, and it got pretty hot, sitting at well over 200 degrees Fahrenheit. Doing this helped me pinpoint where the source of heat generation was coming from, which in fact was the, actually the PCB, or the driver circuit. So I took it a step further and followed the circuit traces, because seeing where the most current is drawn would help me with outlining the circuit later on. A quick thing to mention were the transformer wire locations relative to the PCB. In this case, there are two inputs, and we have one that's in the center of the transformer that goes to the upper left. That cut one right there goes to about midway of the PCB. And then we have this red wire, which is the positive input. That's twisted together and goes to the primary side. It kind of reminds me of like a dual B sort of design. So taking a closer look at the driving circuit with its no-name transistor, we kind of just have to figure out what the pins are. 
on the right side, I'm thinking that's got to be the emitter. And then on the left side, it looks like it's a collector with that F7 diode and 300 ohm resistor. And then I suspect the top left to be the base. So with that information in mind, I recorded everything I could see on the upper PCB and then started a basic schematic to sketch out kind of a roadmap of what's going on here. Now before I continue, I'm sure some of y'all are asking questions like, what the heck is a transistor? Or how does the diode even work? Why do you need that kind of component? Well, I'll start with a transistor. Basically, a transistor is like an electric switch, whereas instead of mechanical motion, you have an electric current or, ele or a voltage applied on one side, and that turns it on, essentially it completes the circuit. In this case, it's a current controlled switch. And the reason that that's important is because you have to generate a kind of an AC voltage for a transformer to work. And then a diode is like a check valve, um, but an electric check valve. So when a voltage is applied in what's called a forward condition, then it'll let electric current flow, but in reverse, it won't at all. And I'll leave some links in the description of really great channels that do an excellent job of describing this if you're interested in exploring this in further detail. But for the sake of this video, that's about all you need to know. I also wanted to mention that LG105 is found on both the PCB and the polymer housing. And whenever you Google that, you find just the 400 kilovolt output boost module. So in order to map out section two with more clarity, I went ahead and started removing the high voltage capacitors. There was a process that involved desoldering and then prying with a screwdriver, but it proved pretty effective in removing them. Then I have the separated secondary board and the individual capacitors, in which I can read model numbers off of now. After recording their values in the 1600 volt rating, I was able to do a brief Google search and find them on eBay for a couple dollars. I was also able to record the value of 8.2 nanofarads as their capacitance. In order to better see how the interior components were arranged, I had to remove additional potting material and then it helped to also desolder some of the pins. While I was evaluating some of the interior components, I decided to go ahead and remove the high voltage resistor. Unfortunately, it was broken into two pieces, I suspect when I was disassembling it initially with the pliers. So after picking at section 2 for a while, I was finally able to see the interior of the voltage multiplier. And on the bottom, you can see the PCB. Clearly, the left side is the transformer input, and on the right side is the output. After carefully studying the component arrangement in the PCB, I was able to sketch a circuit layout. I did attempt multiple times to determine a near exact value of the high voltage load resistor. However, due to the laminate coating that was on the ceramic material, it didn't seem to be consistent. So based on the values that I was reading, I went ahead and assumed a value of 100 mega ohms. With the majority of the components now accounted for, I continued to iteratively draw the circuit diagrams until I had one that I was pretty happy with. On the second one for section one, I have the collector, base, and emitter all labeled accordingly too. I did the same iterative process with section two, only with emphasis behind simplification by rearrangement. For example, I took those three high voltage capacitors linked in series and I solved for their equivalent capacitance equaling 2.7 nanofarads. I did this with the objective of seeing that familiar voltage multiplier circuit. For those of you asking what a voltage multiplier is, it's essentially a clever arrangement of capacitors and diodes that will take an AC input and multiply it by a factor of how many stages there are. In this case, this is a half wave voltage doubler. For those of you wanting to learn more on how voltage multiplier circuits work, EEV blog has an excellent video on the subject, and I'll leave his video in the description below. Here we have the combination of the two sections. Now, starting with a three volt DC input, it starts a switching process, which gets an AC voltage generated. That then gets stepped up through the transformer and then sent to that voltage multiplier. 
this voltage multiplication ends up producing our high voltage DC output, which in this case is about 40 kilovolts. Quick thing to mention about section two is that I may have incorrectly located the ground, so I relocated it. But if anyone has any opinions or thoughts on that, feel free to comment. Speaking of possible errors in the way that the circuit diagram was laid out, the same could be said for section one in the way that it was arranged with this no-name transistor. The leftmost pin on the transistor with the diode and resistor in series could in fact be the base, and the upper left-hand corner could be the collector. I think the reason that I assumed that it was the way it was was looking at the temperature characteristics and how much heat was being delivered from that resistor. This made sense to me because the collector current is always larger than the base current, typically around three orders of magnitude. Commonly in smaller BJTs, collector currents tend to be in the milliamp region, whereas base currents tend to be in the microamp region. This would be easier to lay out if I knew the transistor model and therefore a data sheet because then I can map it out. However, I may have to figure out a way that I can map out the transistor without knowing any of that. Any suggestions are appreciated. On a whim, I decided to go ahead and measure that 300 ohm resistor. And this shows my inexperience in service mount devices because it turns out that third digit is a power of 10 multiplication factor. So it's actually 30 ohms. In addition to finding the resistance of that resistor, I also wanted to find the forward voltage drop of the F7 diode, which is about 496 millivolts or half a volt. So here we have the final circuit diagram, or at least what I think is the most accurate interpretation of what's happening anyways. We'll start with that three volt DC input, which in this case is represented by the two AA batteries. It sends power both through the primary of the transformer and the switching device, which is the MPN BJT. That gets a switching process going, which generates a high frequency AC signal. Those switching oscillations then go through the step up transformer, and thanks to Faraday's law of induction, produces a high AC voltage. That high AC voltage then goes through this half wave voltage multiplier, where it then produces a 40 kilovolt DC on the output. One of the parts that I had uncertainties towards were the true arrangement of this BJT. Since I didn't really know where the pins were located, I kind of just put together what I thought made sense. The two main points of this video were to not only find out how this device works, but also to discuss the possible failure modes that could have happened. I know that this is just visual speculation, but I do suspect that the bottleneck of reliability, shall we say, is probably within these small high voltage capacitors or these small or these high voltage diodes. I have some ideas on how to pinpoint the exact mode of failure, but because this video has already gone way over what I expected it to be, I'm just going to save that for a future video. Besides all that, I hope this video is interesting and that you learned something, because I know I certainly did. All right, so that concludes the first ever episode of Stimbin. I know it's hard a lot nowadays, but if you enjoyed the video, feel free to like, share, subscribe, hit the bell, all that good stuff. I plan on doing a follow-up video for this as well, uh, basically taking the what I've learned in the reverse engineering and also whenever I pinpoint the failure mode, whatever broke on it basically, and building a better one, designing and building a better one, because I have plans to use high voltage generation with some power behind it for other projects too. I'm definitely going to have to do a part two because this first episode took way longer than I had anticipated originally. I thought it would only be like 11 minutes. And uh, anyways, the videos on this channel are just going to be with like a STEM focus, uh, science, technology, engineering, mathematics, anything like that. Um, that's the idea. So if you're interested, stick around and I'll see you on the next one.